I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after the skin one destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself. Mine eyes shall behold, and not enough. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we carry nothing out. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We are stranger before thee and soldier and for all our fathers. Our days on the earth are as a shadow and there is none about. Lord, make me to know my need and the measure of my day. What it is that I may know I am. For I know that thou wilt bring me to death, to the house of mourning, for all living. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave me.
has all appeared before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the thing done in, in his body. According to that he has done, whether it be good or bad. My friends, the hour is coming in the which all that are in the brain shall hear his voice and shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection of such the second death has no power. They shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine,
when Marvin Hall, the esteemed pastor of the greater St. Luke Missionary Baptist Church, and her pastor. At this time, we're going to have scripture, Old Testament, and New Testament, and prayer. The New Testament will be by Reverend Kevin Mercer. Old Testament by Reverend Yvonne Ogier and prayer by Reverend Willow Ray Ball, Home Baptist, Home Baptist Missionary Baptist Church, where Reverend, where uh, Luther Mercer is the member in that order. She make it fine linen and selleth it and delivers girls unto the merchant. Strength and honor are her clothing, and she shall receive and rejoice in time to come. She opened her mouth with wisdom. And in her tongue is the law of kindness. She looketh well to the ways of her household, and eateth not the bread of idleness. Her children arise up and call her blessed. God 
we thank you for this hour. We thank you for this chance, this opportunity, God, just uh, first of all, tell you thank you. God, we thank you for Believe God in the brighter day. So we 
ask that you would prop them on every lead side. Build them up, God, where they're torn down. Give them just a glimmer of insight, knowing, God, that you just walked through your garden and shows that beautiful bouquet. And you make no mistakes. When you say in our spirit that you're coming back, you're crying out to us, be thou all so ready. God, have your way with us. In Jesus' name, we pray and ask it all.
Lucius. And Harold Carter, branch president of the NAACP, is coming. Mayor Scott Conger, City of Jackson. Dr. J. Lawrence Turner, National Act Network. Dr. Darius Jackson, Director of Science and Corruption Board. In that order, will you come? Amen. To the Mercer family from beyond, Jonathan from the NAACP National Chair, to Derek Johnson, President and CEO of the NAACP National Office, all the members of the Board of Directors, and from Gloria Jean Sweetlove, who is the State President, Board of Directors member, and also the National Membership Chair. Condolences to the family. Let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story. Those he redeemed from the hand of the fall. As some people journey through life, they leave footprints of kindness, love, and courage, passion, joy, and faith. Even when they are gone, the trail that they have left behind continues to inspire us can reflect victorious journeys in. Through life and tireless work, fellow freedom fighter Shirley and Mercer, countless others' lives have been changed. Whereas on August the 3rd, 2023, with Shirley and Mercer, a renowned community advocate, civil rights activist, and educator died after a life of dedicated service and unprecedented value to the cause of civil rights and social justice. She exemplified the true love for the people and whereas Ms. Mercer, who was the last living member of the Civil Rights Iconic Figures, the four freshmen from Lane Thomas Chapter the NAACP, demonstrated courage and struggle for equity and equality in times that it was dangerous to do so. And whereas Mrs. Mercer, who was a scrapping down life member of the Jackson Madison County branch of the NAACP and the assistant Assisting the Tennessee State Conference and WSCP with many of its advocacy opportunities and efforts, believed in the mission of the NAACP and worked diligently with individuals across all races, professionals, and walks of life to advocate for social justice, equality, and public safety. And whereas Ms. Mercer's tenacity and courageous spirit has left a lasting impact on the NAACP and all those she encountered. And her legacy is a great servant of people will continue to inspire countless others to public service. Therefore, be it resolved that the Tennessee State Conference and the Jackson Madison County Branch of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People stands with solemn gratitude and salute the life of this dedicated soldier. And be it further resolved that we stand in humble submission to the will of an all-knowing and all-powerful God, and that we humbly give thanks to God for sending us this mighty warrior and allowing her to dwell with us for 80 years, and that we extend our deepest love and sympathy to her husband, Luther, her children, Tina, and Luke's second, and the entire family, and be it finally resolved that a copy of this resolution be given to the Mercer family and a copy be placed in the minutes of the Tennessee State Conference and the Jackson Madison County branch of the NAACP. I'm going to submit this ninth day of August in the year of our Lord, 2023. Signed Harold Carter, President of Jackson Madison County branch of the NAACP, and Gloria J. Sweetlove, State Conference President.
just mail in the runoff. So who are you running against? Before I could answer, she said, well, it doesn't matter. You better win. <laughs> and so uh, that is the kind of advice she gave. And so uh, look around the room. We're all here today in more ways than one because of Shirley Mercer. Proclamation reads, also want to recognize for our read that is our city council members on the think, second and third row here, first row, the first row here. Thank you for being here and representing the city of Jackson. Where Shirley Mercer passed from this life on Wednesday, August 2nd, 2023. Where Shirley Mercer was born in Jackson, where she attended public schools and graduated from Mary High School. Shirley continued her studies at Lane College and later graduated from the University of Memphis, became a public school teacher and taught for 24 years. We can stop there. That's a lot. She was married to Luther Mercer and mother of Tina and Luther II. Where she was a member of the freshman four, a group of Brave Lane College students who entered Woolworths and sat down at the whites only lunch counter and was arrested on several occasions. Where Shirley was a living legend in the Jackson community. Her determination and drive to defy Jim Crow laws and fight for equal rights was the foundation of her life. She has a lengthy record of civic activism. Providing for civil rights in the 1960s to lead marches against crime in neighborhoods across Jackson. It included honorable recognitions from numerous dignitaries and prominent officials such as Vice President Al Gore, Governor Don Sundquist, Governor Phil Bredesen, Senator Bill Friss, Congressman Harold Ford Jr., and former NAACP Director of Benjamin Books. Whereas in 1989, Shirley became the Director of District Services for Congressman John Tanner. She was named one of the year by Delta Sigma Beta Sorority. Inducted into the Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Community Affairs Hall of Fame and awarded Living Legends Award by the Jackson Chapter of the NAACP. And the list goes on from there. Whereas her passionate belief that people should be treated equally, that everyone's voice matters, combined with a natural ability to bring people together, led Ms. Mercer to a life of public service. And whereas we remember Shirley Mercer's family and recognize their support of her, her family was the foundation in which she stood so she could serve her beloved city. Whereas the city of Jackson, we honor the pillars of our community, such as Shirley and Mercer, who devoted their lives to equal rights and stood bravely in the face of hate to create change. Her legacy will live forever in the city of Jackson and the Jackson community. So now, therefore, I, Scott Conner, mayor of the city of Jackson, Tennessee, do hereby proclaim today, August 9, 2023, at Shirley Mercer Day, in honor of the legacy she leaves in Jackson. Thank you. Thank you. to the 
remarks, we want to recognize our honored guests today. All the city officials, county officials, state officials that are present today, we just ask you to stand. Charlene with her bandana 
and all of us gathering over to old Jackson High School and marching down to a park not far from here, marching every Friday afternoon to reinforce young people against drugs, marching, 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 up with hope and down with dope. I can hear it. Now, I was trying to grasp what I could say about Charlene being a successful person who wanted to make the world better in every way for everybody. And this poem came to mind. That person is a success who has lived well, laughed often, and loved much, who has gained the respect of intelligent people and the love of tiny children who found her niche and accomplished her task, who left the world a better place than when she found it, whether by a perfect poem or a rescued soul, who never lacked appreciation for the beauty of the earth, nor failed to express it, and who looked for the best in others and gave the best she had. Shirley gave us the best she had. Amen. Shirley, Shirley, can you tell me what 
what should I do? She said, let me give you the phone number and let me call her first and then you can give me five minutes and then you call her. I said, go ahead on, Shirley. So I'm here today to say, when you look at your program, and you will see on the, on the front page where it says, don't have my glasses, I'm looking like 10, 14, 42. And on the other side of that, there's a dash, but on the other side of that, it says 11, 2, 2023. Those two things are not that relevant. The dash is what's so important to you. You can just look at it, read the obituary, read the accomplishments. That dash represents her work and the things that she's done. And I'm here today because of that dash. Not because of the first date or the second date. I'm here because of the dash. We have put to rest a great warrior of mankind. She will not be forgotten, Mr. Mercer. She's not only loved and respected, not only here in your area, but in my heart and in our area in Shelby County as well. Live on, Shirley. We love you. God bless you. Praise be to God to this wonderful Mercer family, to all the pastors and politicians who are here to pay tribute to this great friend and great leader and warriors, my dad said, to my old friend John Tanner and to Betty Ann and to all of the leaders here in this community. I was reminded as John was speaking of the words of the great Ralph Ellison who said that power doesn't have to show off. Power is confident with it. Self-assuring, Tina, self-starting and self-stopping. When you have it, you know it. She had it. She not only had it because she wanted it or she had it because she wanted it for herself, she had it and used it on our behalf. So many of the young people, I, I remember those crime marches like they were yesterday. We live in a time when our politicians lead with division and lowliness. We live in a time when our politics is not only polarized, but polluted. She led in politics with not a pettiness, with not a judgmental bone in her body, but how do you help and how do you lift up? She was led by a simple compass on which more, not only in politics, but in business and academia, led with it too. She had a simple compass. Does it enhance humanity? Or does it erode it? Didn't matter where it came from, Republican or Democrat. John and I called ourselves Democrats. We worked with Republicans much like Shirley wanted us to. The Bible reminds us that we are at our best when we live in hope and love. She personified that not only in how she lived, but how she worked. She inspired us in all of those ways. Remember, out of living in love and hope comes love, kindness, compassion, care, openness, and an ability to forgive and heal. If indeed, Brother Shaw, we want her politics and what she meant and all of the things that she did to live on, let us all pledge today to be less judgmental. Amen. Let us all pledge today to be less petty. Let us all pledge today to try to forgive and try to live with the hope that she did. To try to work with not only that hope, but to but try to bring about those results. I'm reminded of the words of that great American, American Renaissance writer, Zora Neale Hurston, who once said, there are years that ask questions and there are years that answer. Charlene didn't know if she was living when they were being asked or when they were being answered. But what she did do was always try to answer on our behalf. Ms. Mercer, thank you for being an example. Thank you for loving. Thank you for giving. 
and thank you for never giving up on us. In Jesus' name we say, amen. I want that clinic to be 
something that the community will embrace and be proud of. And I want you to make sure that you have a minority physician that is practicing there. We searched and searched, and that's a whole different story. But we found Dr. Jimmy Kim so proud. He came and helped lead and build and develop that clinic. Charlene changed and had our health care under Dr. Pratt. And I could, I could go on and on about how the clinic really started coming together and how it expanded, how we added pharmacy and we added uh, behavioral health and all these different initiatives. Well, the rest of the story is East Jackson opened in 1994. I go on to say that we still have a plaque on that building recognizing Ms. Mercer for her contributions and her dedication to making that clinic happen. The clinic transitioned from just a primary care location to a federally qualified health clinic. And when that transition, we were talking about that, I made sure I went and sat with Ms. Charlene. She said, one, is it going to continue to serve the people? Yes, ma'am. Number two, is it going to continue to serve the community? Yes, ma'am. Number three, are people from all over going to be able to be served there? Yes, ma'am. She said, well, all right, then. The great thing about it, it was the first federally qualified health clinic in Madison County. Shirley Mercer's vision Shirley Mercer was a great 
Maryland, class of 1960. I'm so grateful to our alumni association and the many Maryites that on last year, it was our 100th anniversary of the founding of Mary High, and she received our Austin Mary Community Service Award. And I say this to say that I would like for all the graduates of Mary High to stay the greatest high school in Tennessee, all Mary High. Of course, the offspring of Edward Jackson City of America, very high, that great institution. Now, I take off that hat and I put on the hat as the executive director of the Jackson Recreation Parks Department. And I want to thank Councilman Dodd. He was the impetus behind wanting that park named while Miss Mercer lived because there was some unwritten policy. The city kind of didn't want to honor people with a, something named after them if they were still living. Uh -huh. But with a name like Shirley Mercer, who's gonna say no? <laughs> and he was adamant. And so when the program says October 2020, but it was actually in 2009, we dedicated something else in 2020. But it is indeed an honor to have a park in East Jackson, named after Ms. Shirley Mercer. And what we've done with the park is we've made it basically what she was. It's a park for people to come and reflect. It's a passive park. But it also is a memorial of the great African-American leaders that made Jackson the city that it is. For years, they have not been recognized. This is a part that is, fulfills that role. Now, many of you said that, you know, when Ms. Charlene asks you something, you just do it. Uh, I used to go by and talk with her a lot. She said, you know, we need some picnic benches down there. <laughs> there are picnic benches down there. Uh, she, you do work for her. And so we're so grateful uh, that uh, the family has allowed us to have that legacy to continue on. And there are those that are planning some things in the future. So we will continue to make that part a focus of, of that community. Then on the other side, taking off that hat, I worked with her. Uh, see, a lot of you don't know. See, a lot of y'all, it's a lot y'all don't know about Shirley. A lot of y'all think y'all know about Miss Shirley. But it's a lot y'all really don't know because she really don't toot her horn with a lot of stuff she do. Uh, she started a foundation called CORE, Children on the Right Path. And I serve on that board, and she raises money. She certainly loves children. Now, you can debate about a lot of things, but it's one thing that I know. She loves children, and she loves doing things for children. So Christmas, she gets the police department, go shop, and they buy toys for all of the underprivileged kids. Our relationship, uh, Gillian League was a league that the young African American kids played. They played right over here with the police department, down on the institute. I played for Jack and Jim. And for years, that was a league that a lot of the African American kids played in, because we couldn't play in the white leagues. And so that league, at some point, died out. And so when I became uh, the director of T.R. White, I met with Ms. Sterling and told her that I was going to bring the Gillian League back. And she said, that's a good thing. And so with her help, not just her help from the perspective of who she is, you know, she put skin in the game. So what she did would contact businesses and also provide money where we don't charge the kids anything. She paid for the uniforms. She had pizza parties at the park for them. And Tina continues that work today. So that's a lot that you don't know that she does. She does a lot that she doesn't toot her horn about. But I tell you, 
That is a beautiful, beautiful woman. That is a strong woman. I don't have problems strong women. Some men ain't got problems strong women. I'm married to a will. <laughs> my mama was a strong woman. Matter of fact, my mama was best friends with L.T. and her mother. My grandmother, my, my grandmother. But my mother was strong. I, I'm not intimidated by strong women. I love strong women. Now take off that hat. Put on this hat. So I used to talk to Shirley a lot. And Shirley said, you ever thought about running for political office? I said, no, man. I'd rather just be in the Trinity. She said, you know, you ought to run for something sometimes. I thought about it. I said, no, nah, I'm sure. Well, last year I decided to run for county commission. Now, Miss Shirley wasn't in a position to don't do no work. So what did I do? I ain't done. I got to see <laughs> Tina to be my campaign man. <laughs> Most politicians won't tell you this. We know nothing about running campaign. That's why they hire somebody or ask somebody to take charge. What well, Tina did that for me. And guess what? I'm a campaign <laughs> I'm smart enough to know that I need a mentor. See, I'm, I'm old, but I'm young in politics, but I ain't stupid. So when you need to get advice or you're trying to know what's going on and figure out that thing called the county commission, who best to talk to than Mr. L.T.? We know I call him a mentor. He's my mentor. And I'm not afraid to tell anybody. I love these verses. I know them all. I love them all. I love them. You know, when Ralph was living, Ralph was here, I mean, when Jerry, was, I'm not trying to put you away, Ralph. <laughs> Jerry, Dwight, all of them. I, 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 I was told I was playing with the first one. But I love this family. I appreciate you allowing me this opportunity. I'm just going to keep it real. This family is a good family. This should be worse. They don't make them like that no more. So I do not, they do not make them like that. And she, now you know, y'all can sugarcoat it all you want. Now she could use some so much words sometimes when she talking to me in a conversation. And she was direct to the point, and I like that. But again, to the family, of all the hats I got on you, I condolences on this. Amen. Thank you, LT, for being the man you are. Amen. Tina, thank you for being the daughter that you are. Amen. Luther Jr., thank you for being the man that you are. You're a fighter, brother. Yes, he is. Keep Amen. fighting. Keep fighting. And that's my mantra when it comes to thinking about Miss Shirley Mercy. She was a fighter. And in this day and age, we need fighters. I'm going to talk about, you know, they're trying to take stuff from us. They don't want to take black history. Come on, y'all. They're talking about slavery. We learned from slavery. Come on, let's get real. We need more fighters. And I know she don't mind me saying this. You need to get registered. You need to get to vote. You need to mobilize. Because we got to fight.
creed, class, or background. Lame Lady Shirley Ross Mercy was one such extraordinary soul, a beacon of hope who illuminated the path toward a more just and equitable world. Shirley's unwavering commitment to civil rights was not simply a career or a cause. It was a calling that flowed from the very depth of her being. She believed with a conviction that was unshakable. She believed that every person deserved to be treated with dignity and respect. And she fought tirelessly to dismantle the barriers of discrimination and prejudice that still mar our society today. Her journey was not an easy one. Charlene arrived on the campus of Wayne College as a wide-eyed and idealistic student in the fall of 1960. While most students quickly immerse themselves in doing what 18 and 19 year olds do, Charlene was different. While they were partying, she was picketing. Hmm. While they were sleeping, she was strategizing. And while they were marveling, she was marching. In addition to our student studies, her mind was focused on the glaring inequality and inequities that existed between the races at a time when signs and water fountains in Jackson falsely declared that water was white and colored. To Shirley, water was clear. As a member of what came to be known as the Freshman Four at Wayne College, she was thrust into the civil rights struggle when she was spat upon, kicked, and arrested numerous times because she dared to order a meal in Woolworth on Main Street. After graduating from Wayne in 1964 with a BS degree and teacher certification, she was forced to practice her profession as a public school teacher, not in her hometown, but in a county outside of Madison, because those persons in authority here in Madison County refused to hire her as a teacher because of her prior active participation in bringing down the walls of segregation. Shirley faced opposition, ad adversity, and even danger, but she never wavered. She marched in the face of hatred, spoke out against injustice, and worked diligently to forge alliances and build bridges between communities. Her courage, determination, and selflessness inspired others to join in the struggle for equality, and her legacy will continue to motivate generations to come. As we mourn the loss of Lane Lady Shirley Rouse Mercer, let us also celebrate the incredible impact that she had on our world. Let us remember the lives she touched, the minds she opened, and the hearts she changed. Let us be inspired by her example to continue the fight for justice and equality, to never back down in the face of adversity, and to always stand up for what is right. In honoring Shirley's memory, let us recommit ourselves to the ideals she held so dear. Let us strive to create a world where every person is truly judged by the content of their character rather than the color of their skin. Let us work tirelessly to eradicate the systemic injustices that still persist. And let us do so with the same passion and dedication that Shirley demonstrated throughout her life. Though she may no longer be with us in body, her spirit lives on in the countless lives she touched and the progress she helped to achieve. As we say our final farewell, let us carry forward her legacy with pride, knowing that we are the beneficiaries of her tireless efforts and unwavering devotion. So I say rest in power, Shirley. Although your work is done, the flame of caring, compassion, and concern that you ignited during your lifetime 
of service to others will continue to burn brightly until inclusion and equity are achieved for all. May God bless us all. Amen. Amen. Like that. 
But you all have something to do. She taught us all. It didn't matter what our background was. We all have a purpose. And whatever that purpose is that you choose, make sure it's about picking up the next person that enters your life. Because none of us, regardless of your status, regardless of your economic level, we all connect to one another and we all have something to give. Amen. Amen. With everything that we did, as I said at 14, our families became so entwined. It, it was just natural. If I thought that I needed to make a major decision for my family, my children, and our children grew up together. We shared a lot of major events. We traveled together. We, we had school breaks after, we, we had the spring breaks from EDS. Shirley opened that door for families to send their children to EDS. Yeah. You know, that's not something I would pursue, but she pushed education. She pushed public education, let me say that. But she also pushed the fact that no door was to be closed to anybody. I don't care where you were, what you provided. We had the ability to walk through any door that was created and didn't really care who created it. I, I, I heard some of those nice conversations, persuasive words that Shirley used but the outcome was, did we walk away with being able to have equal access? And we did. So again, celebrate, take the challenge, because it does not stop here. It does not stop here. You, you know, yes, we're going to miss her. I miss her terribly. I've rewritten and rethought and rethought it again of what I needed to say, and I can hear Shirley say, just say what needs to be said, keep it short, and go sit down. <laughs> <laughs> so with, with all of that being said, again, Shirley's work does not stop today. Don't let it. Yes, she loved children. I was a child when I met her. And again, keeping me with her, I learned that if she said, I need you to go over and volunteer your time to Families in Actions, to the Boys and Girls Club, if I need you to work with the police department, and we had our lock-ins, we got all the kids, we had our lock-ins at Park Courts and Lincoln Courts, it didn't matter. You just did it. And people came forth. I mean, different backgrounds. Don't let it stop today. Because our children are almost in a worse situation today. And they need everybody's help. Right. They need everybody's help. Yeah. So when we leave here today, commit to, you're going to grab some child. You're going to volunteer your time at some organization to make it easier and better for every child that is a part of this community. It does not matter what your position is. You, you know, if you love, put your love to action. Because that's the show you worship that I think. Amen. To the family, Tina, I thank you for allowing me this opportunity. Because I loved Shirley. And I will hang on to the fact that the last time I got to visit her, a couple of months ago, and, and it was on a Sunday right after church, LTU was here. I was able to express some things to her, and as I was walking out the door, I stopped and said, Shirley, I love you. And surprisingly, because I didn't think she, she could really hear me, she said, Jimmy Ruth, I love you too. So that's what I want to go into. Thank you. Now I say amen.
nieces to stand as they come to show their support for them. All the nieces and nephews stand at this time as they come. First honor these pastors. Again, she was a devout Christian. However, I want to let you know she covered a lot of bases. She made sure that in several religions she was good. <laughs> in that her heart was light as a feather. In that she won submitted. In that, I want to say to my father, thank you for being the father, the husband, the man who stood by my mother. Second mother. <laughs> <laughs> that when my mother was there, my birth mother, 
<coughs> she has been, still is, the most biggest pain in my side <laughs> that I can ever say that has existed. And I love her to absolute death. She has fought for me, she fought for my mother, and I love you for that. To those who are not blood family, Air Force A, Air Force B, John Cannon, Chrissy Little, or Jeff Little Speaker. <laughs> to, 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 to all those Johnny Dodd and others who sit in this wonderful place, who again are not. Blood family, but our family, thank you. Mm -hmm. Amen. To friends in this room who extend through not only through me and team, the mothers, thank you. Now, I'm going to give you one or two quick stories. I was uh, not always late and gentlemen on the right path. <laughs> let's just say, let's just use that term. <laughs> and they say, you raise your children up to be. You know, sometimes we make straight but we, in the book it says you'll come back. Yeah. Well, in this journey, ladies and gentlemen, and one night, I was out with an older cousin who happened to be a member of the street pharmacy community. <laughs> And I, I, I'm 
I'm lying. I'm not lying. Yeah. She said, who's your mother? And she goes, oh, well, her boy, I said, this lady, sure. <laughs> and he goes, get your ass. <laughs> And I told her, I said, well, Barbara, look, I won't do it. And she said, that I'm not the point. The lady said, what I'm going to tell you is this. By her favor. That's right. Well, 
for old clicks, again, for those who already know uh, 92, 93, you know, Lagoa, and Clinton, so she says, uh, the lady, it's a good couple, they got this, uh, hey, turn it. Let me ask you, hey, I said, sir, my friend, I don't, uh, this is a son, I got a cell phone. He goes, okay, uh, just let him know I called and tell him to call me back. And I said, sir, is this number? He said, yeah. That's okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and so, at that point, I called back. I mean, I go home and I get the phone. I said, Mom, you know, uh, 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 vice president called. She said, the vice president of what? <laughs> <laughs> she said, who? Like, what vice president? And I said, well, you know, I, you know, I mean, the vice president of the United States. And she goes, what do you want? I don't know. <laughs> if you want to take it and invent the internet, I don't know. I mean, all I know is that he called to Talk to you. And he, I said, she goes, oh, well, okay, I'm going to call him back. You know, he does the number of the phone. I said, yeah, I didn't erase anything. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, I said, I've always known this mother. I said, there's more to this lady. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's something else special about this woman that I might not necessarily I leave you with this. Thank you so much to everyone in this room for being and giving honor to my mother over the last 10 years. Amen. That song that says, Give the Rose of Gladness. For that, the soul. Well, very few of us get out to do it because when death comes so fast, Okay, you, you didn't have that time. But over the last decade, y'all, you gave her a rose. And my mother used to ask me this question. She said, are you proud of me? And I said, why don't you ask such a <coughs> dumb question? <laughs> and in, the, in this conversation as I end, for this, this presentation, I, I do want to say this. There's two ways that the universe knows you exist. I was looking at this 3D model online at YouTube, and they had this 3D model where it takes you from the sun all the way out into the outer universe. And it shows the vastness of the universe planets and the solar system and the galaxy and the, the void's void. There's two ways that I thought about that the universe even knows you exist because it, we're no more than a speck in time in relation to this. One is legacy to your children. All right. Two is your work. That's even the reason the universe even knows they did. My mother <coughs> lives through us. Yes. But her works live through all of us. Yes. Because that's the only thing that survives after. Yes. 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 so that the living shall die. 
transition of care and home, I bet it was 20 trips back and forth. Praise God. We prayed mightily every time we entered the room. Pray God choice blessing upon her that he was sustain her and undergird her with his power. Didn't like to see Shirley like that. This vibrant, energized person that just was on the go all her life. But now she is resting. And you know what's ironic that they built a walking trail park in her honor. She couldn't even enjoy it. She couldn't even enjoy it. But let me tell you, God is so good. Seeing her there that morning, Luther, I got to thinking about the word of God that's so comforting. What is this all about? She, she made her transition. This is the house she lived in. This is the part that God shared with me. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13, I will not have you ignorant, brother, concerning them which Certain things you need to understand when it comes to death. You know, you need to be absent-minded of the very thing that transpired. I will not have you ignorant concerning them which are asleep. She's sleeping. For here's what the Bible said for comforting. If you believe that Jesus died, And rose again. Even them that sleep in Jesus. Will God bring with them. For this we say to you. By the word of God. That they would sleep. Hallelujah. God gives you revelation about what he wants to comfort you with in times like these. Amen. And I know, amen, there are those of us who, family especially, it's hard to digest this. Yes, it is. But let me tell you, when death invades our ranks, when there is, amen, life that has been extinguished, amen, in this body, but you still live, amen, there is a spiritual side of it. We're looking at the natural side. the natural sign, we go through all these things mentally. Oh, we're not going to see her no more. She's going to know. Surely never been more all right in all the days of her life. Hallelujah. And God wants us to understand. Rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice. She's all right. Glory to God. She's not dead. And he said that when we, amen, accept the fact what Jesus did on Calvary, we won't die. Amen. It ain't no death in Jesus. It's life. I came that you might have life and life more abundantly. Well, what is this all about? What are we doing? We're having a, no, no, no. We celebrate her life, amen, that was here. We can glorify in heaven. Praise God. Amen. When we are absent from the body, she made a transition in the morning. Slept right on the way. My God. I wouldn't want to leave here like that. Go to bed. Sleep here on this side. And wake up in heaven. Somebody ought to put their hand 
together for strength, amen. Charlene transition that she left here peacefully. She left here, amen, without any. God bless you. My prayer is that we're going to see her again if we live the life. All she would say, we would pray, Shirley, with that little deformed hand would grab my hand. We would pray, hallelujah. And sometimes when she could hardly utter a word, when we got through praying, and I said, amen, that mouth came over and said, amen. <laughs> Get to know this God. Get to know this Christ that's able to transform us and change us into the image of his dear son. We bless you in the name of the Lord. I love this family. We give you glory, God, for all you did in sharing this life. What a great life. Amen. I thought about it also with everything that's going on with people. Amen. Comment. There's an old gospel song. Amen. Said, May the life, may the works I've done speak for me. May the life I live speak for me. May the service that I give is speaking now.
bless you this evening to this family and to Reverend Clutch and all of the ministers and all of the dignitaries that are here. To all of you, my sisters and brothers and all of you, my father's children, it is just good to be alive. It gives us another chance to tell God thank you and to get it right. So we're grateful for this privilege, this opportunity to come and to share here on this afternoon. Jewel of a lady, it has been said by everyone that has come forth, it has been said several times about all of the accolades, all the things that she accomplished. But I knew her in a few years that I've been in Jackson. I knew her as a humble spirit. Every time I'd go by the house to commune her, to share with her, she would always ask about the church. She would always ask me about my wife. And she would always want us to sing to pray with her. The last time I was with her was in Jackson General. She told me she had been there some probably 10, 15 times since Christmas or since the New Year started. She had been there so many times. Many times I didn't even know she had been to the hospital. But when I found out, I went. And when I walked in, she didn't know who I was. Because the last time she saw me, I weighed about 400 pounds. And then when I got there this time, I was about 240. And she didn't know who I was. And I said, Mama, I said, do you know who I am? She said, no, I can't. I said, I'm Master Hall. She said, what? Where's the rest of you? <laughs> I get that quite a bit now. <laughs> but uh, I heard you've been sick. I heard you've been going through. She said, yeah. I've been sick a lot. I've been in and out of the hospital. She said, look like time I go home, I come right back. And I looked at her and I said, Mama, I said, I want you to talk to me. What is your conversation like with God? What are you asking for? What are you, what are you talking to him about? She's around I just want to know that my family, my children are going to be all right. And I looked at her and I said, Mama, they're already all right. Because they're in the hand of God. I know both of them have had medical challenges, just as you, your husband, all of you have been going through some difficult times. I said, but when we look back over our lives, the Lord has kept us. In spite of everything that we've gone through, dear hearts, I want to remind us that God is still in control. He still has all power in heaven and earth in his hand. Our God is still a healer. He's still a deliverer. He's working miracles even right now. So, after our conversation, I prayed with her. And I told her I had to go. And I kissed her on the forehead and said, I love you. She said, I'm going to know you the next time I see you. Well, needless to say, I didn't get to see her again on this side. But she promised me she'd know me the next time we see each other.
I'm going to hold her today. All right. <laughs> that she'll know who I am when we get on with it. That's a passage of scripture that was read earlier. Amen. One of the brothers, brother, Reverend Kevin Mercer, he talked about 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. There the apostle tells the young comrade, Timothy, he looked at him and he said, as for me. He said, son, my life is already been poured out. As a drink offering. He said, My time has come, the time of my departure is at hand. I'm getting ready to die. He said, But I want you to know I fought a good fight. I've kept the faith. I've finished my course. He said, now there's a prize that's laid up for me. The crown of righteousness. What's the Lord going to give when he come back again? And it's not only for me, but it's to everyone who eagerly waits and look forward to his appearance. I just thought I would tag this text for just a few minutes. The eulogy has already been preached. But I just want to tag this text. A finished course. A finished course. I solicit your prayers, sir and man. This sermon is just a reminder that all of us have a race to run. There have been set before us. Conditions and provisions have been made for you and I to carry out the assignment that God has placed upon us. Many a time, it looks as if though we've been asked to do stuff that we don't feel comfortable or feel that we're worthy or able to do. And a lot of them we're not. And one of the things that impressed me most with God, I hear people say all the time that he won't put no more on us than we can bear. But I want to tell you, he's put some stuff on me that I felt like I couldn't bear. Yeah. But what gave me constellation was, I realized I didn't have to do it by myself. Yeah. What I couldn't do for myself, God was able to do through me. And so I would step to the plate, not knowing what the next moment was going to bring, let's know the next hour or the next situation, not, not being concerned about all of that, but believing that I had a word from God. And I know that when I get a word from God, that everything that I need in order for me to fulfill what God is speaking to me is already in the assignment or already in the word that's spoken to them, to me by God. You think about it. That's creativity in his. When he stepped out of nothing into nowhere and said, let there be, and the world came into existence. Yeah. Just because of the rumor, the breath, the aura of God, because he spoke to the situation, it happened. it happened. Can I tell somebody that today, that I don't care what you're going through, it doesn't matter. If God speaks to your situation, the creativity, the power for you to be sustained and to develop and grow has already been released in the word he spoke to you. 
I remember, I remember uh, earlier this year uh, being in the hospital and, and I was laying there in the bed before surgery, the night before surgery, and 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 and, 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 and I was wondering and just praying and that God let me come through this and, and I saw a shadow in my room. And that shadow stood, but it never would, I never did see his face, but I felt a presence. And I knew it was the presence of the Lord. And he said to me, he said, what do you want from me? I said, God, I want to leave. I want to be healed. And I sit there and I wondered, and, and he spoke to me by spirit and said that I healed you when you asked me. He said, but now you got to trust the process. I didn't know what the process was going to be like. I didn't know what I was going to have to go through. I didn't know what I was going to have to endure. But I found out on the other side of it that I've been healed in spite of it. Listen. Listen, God is an awesome God. My mama used to use a term all the time. He may not come when you want him, but he's always right on time. And I believe that Paul was trying to encourage young Timothy because in chapter 3, it already told him that the wicked times will come and that were men would, would love fables and they would heap to themselves teachers. They would have itching ears. He said sons and daughters would be, would be disobedient to their parents. People would love anything but money and themselves. And they wouldn't care about nobody. He had told them that there was going to come a time when people would not endure sound doctrine. They didn't want to hear the gospel anymore. He had told them. And we're living in those times. We're just seeing this even now in this society. But the confidence of knowing that in the midst of all of this, God prepares us. And I keep hearing people talk about it's going to get better. No, it's not going to get better. Not, not to, to, according to Scripture. It's going to get worse. Wicked are becoming more wicked. Evil is becoming more evil. I mean, the reality is, when, when I look back over the 64 years that I've lived, I've experienced a lot of things and seen a lot of stuff in life. And times have changed. And believe it or not, they have not gotten, they have not gotten better. But the world has gotten worse. I remind Brady St. Luke all the time that we may be 2,000 years more from Calvary. And it may seem like that old phobia and isms and, and faith of the past and none of that matters anymore. But you gotta remember he says he's coming back. So if I'm that far from Calvary, then I may be this close to his return. You got to remember that if you're taking a journey, the farther you get away from where you start, means the closer you are to where you're going. And we got to understand this. Even in this life, in this life, and, and this is this is where, where I really want to. Paul shares his experiences with Timothy and said, Now, son, I've gone the last mile of the way. This is the last look out of the window. This, this, this is the last time I'm going to get to view the sunset. I, the days of my years have come to a close now. And he says that I spent the last of my years in prison. And even with that, the dusty smell reminded him of the journey and was indicative of his demise. God had lifted him above all of his circumstances and brought him before his finished course. He's now at the 
the end of the journey. And he's looking forward because he said, there's a crown that's waiting on me. Life is a crown to us. What are you doing with the time? Somebody said it earlier, between the dash. Between the birth date and the death date. What are you doing with the time in between that's called life? How are we spending this precious commodity that God has entrusted us with while we in time on our way to eternity? What are we doing to impact the generation that lives among us? He said, he said, he said, he said to him, he said, this is where I am, Timothy. My mind is fixed. I'm focusing not on what used to be, but what is to come. I've got a crown waiting on me. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I've I, I preached the gospel. I, I've established churches. I, I, I've stood for the Lord. I've spoken for those that couldn't speak for themselves. And in all of that, I saw Shirley Mercy. Because she was an adamant champion for those that couldn't fight for themselves. She had a voice for them. And she encouraged so many. So many times we'd go by the house and officers would be with me. She'd ask them, how's your children? Did they get in college? How are they doing in school? Let me know if I can do anything to help. She was always concerned about the other man, the other person. Listen, one of the biggest mistakes we make as human beings is forgetting about the next person. We're commanded, first of all, to love God. With all of our heart, with all of our mind, with all of our strength. And then when they asked Jesus about the greatest commandment, he said that was two. Love God. But then love your man as you said. Surely mercy. She knew how to love. See, love ain't just a feeling and emotion. Love is a spirit of self-sacrifice. Willing to give without expecting anything in return. You know how I know? Because God so loved the world. Why would we yet say? He died for the ungodly. That's the. That's the. When you don't keep score, when you're not adding up what folk owe you, when you're not looking around to see what you're going to get out of, but you love because God commanded you. You love because it's right. You love because everybody needs love. Paul was focused on the plan of the church itself, the development of Christians. He says, I'm fixed. My mind is fixed. What means I'm ready. Listen. Surely, Mercer was ready. Because she had got a business fix. She had been poured out as a drink offering. Her life had been well spent serving humanity, being a wife to her husband, being a parent to her children, and mentoring everybody else in the community. Her life was being poured out. Paul says, that 
characterize it as a drink offering. They offered up to God as, 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 as an offering or a sacrifice to God. Give yourself as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. The Bible says this, that is your reasonable service, in other words, your spiritual worship. That's how you really worship God, by serving others, loving God, serving humanity, doing the best you can with what you She was not only ready, but she gave the final offer. She said, said, hey, I'm ready to be offered up. I'm ready. I'm ready to be offered. I'm in a position. I have put myself and conditioned myself to be used by God in whatever capacity or manner that he sees it. Yeah. The old saints used to sing a song, I'll go if I have to go by myself. If my mama don't go, my daddy don't go, sister nor my brother, I'll go if I have to go. Oh, that That's the attitude that we must have as believers, as the saints of God, is that my relationship with God is not about anybody but me and God. I remind the kids at school when I'm at school every day, I remind them that the glory of being a child of God is I don't have to die for nobody else's sin. I don't have to pay for what nobody else did. I only have to give account to God for my reaction to what another person does to me. And when I stand still, I don't have to talk, I don't have to fight. And I'm going to get to that in a minute. Because Paul talks about that that he fought the good fight. He didn't fight this stuff that we see now. Just at the drop of a hat, we want to fight about something. We want to put them up. We want to throw the nukes. We, 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 we want to do the thing. You know? he, no, 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 no. He said, I fought the good fight. I stood in the gap. I remained faithful and committed to God in spite of whatever else was going on around me. I stood for them that couldn't stand for themselves. I saw that thing. Such a mercy. I saw that in her. That same ability. She fought the good fight. She fought it peaceably. Have you ever seen anybody like her? That could mild-manneredly, quietly set you out. <laughs> and do it so cute and nice. Could, I mean, literally, you knew what she meant. But she would be so nice about it. So. Now that was with me. That's what I thought. You know, I, I learned this from the young people that, that everybody don't know people the same way. I was at my niece's funeral and, and one of the kids got upset. Now I heard what the family said about it, but we knew something else. <laughs> I said, oh, it's like that. So you all may know other stuff, and I can't deal with what you know. I only have to deal with what I know. Because every time I was near her, she treated me with utmost respect. Every time, every time, every time. And so, she knew that the time for her departure was in it, but she fought the good fight. Listen, this is what I want to mean. She finished the course. 
I want to tell you that we can read this program, and it's been well put together, beautiful program. It's been marvelous today. All of the accolades, all the things that have been said about Sister Mercer, all of the, 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 the accomplishments that she's made, all of the things that she accomplished in her career and in her life, all of those are phenomenal. They're great. They're awesome. But I believe that the finishing of our course was to think when she got us together in one place. Amen. All different kind of people from every different background. She brought us together at one time. Yeah. Yeah. To hear from God. Amen. In one place. Listen, a lot of people talk about speaking you know, truth to power when power ain't there. But surely it got us together today. She, this is the last who brought. She brought every person that knew her, they either came in and out of the doors yesterday, or they're here today to say farewell and to say, we celebrate your life, to celebrate the time that we had with you, and to say thank you for all that you meant to all of us. We come at one time to say thank you and to see you finished the course. You've stood strong. You've fought hard. You've accomplished the many things. You've done what the Lord has assigned you to do. Amen. Amen. I believe that there is a word called will go. Hmm. Good and faithful servant. Yes, sir. You've been released from this old tabernacle, this old house. And now you got a new home. Oh yeah. Over in time. My, my, my. Absent from this bar yeah. means that she's present with the Lord. Yeah. I'm reminded of the other day that another one said, it's finished. Mm. Hung his head in the locks of his shoulder. Yes, sir. Gave up the goat. He reconnected divinity and humanity. He saved the dying world. All that looked like it was lost. He brought them near. Wow. Out of darkness into the marvelous light. As I leave you though, Paul categorizes himself three, in three ways in this text. First of all, he said that he is a soldier. Which means that he was battle tested, tried and true, put on his arm because he knew he had to go into battle. Second thing was that he categorized himself not only as a soldier, but he categorized, amen, himself as, amen, an athlete, a runner that had finished the race, just carrying the torch and bearing his, his own course in his own reason. He carried the torch, and, and, and now it's time to pass that torch to those that are left behind. Yeah. Thirdly, he categorized himself as a servant. Yeah. Yeah. One that gave himself to his master and to others. Yes, sir. So, my sisters and my brothers, if I was in greater St. Luke, I would take you to another place. Yes, sir. <laughs> Paul said, I fought a good fight. No. He said, I finished my course. Thank you, Shirley, for reminding us that all of us in here have a race to
to run. And you can't run my race. And I can't run yours. I don't you, Pop. But uh, if we stay the course and wait on the Lord, the Bible says.
Jesus 